The Murder Shelf Book Club contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Listener discretion is advised. Steve Wilson, whose father owned a firm, said the love of Veach for Alador was magical. There was something mystical to the whole thing, and you wish that everyone could be exposed to something like that. Perhaps he, Alador, would be able to outdo a firm at stud and even their rivalry that way. And Alador did just that. From Broken, The Suspicious Death of Alador and the End of Horse Racing's Golden Age by Fred M. Cray. Well, welcome to the Murder Shelf Book Club podcast. I am your host, Jill. This is episode 93, Entanglements, on Broken, the Suspicious Death of Alidar, and the End of Horse Racing's Golden Age by Fred M. Cray, Part 2. Part 1 was a mind blower and emotional for me because the threads that weave in and out cannot be skipped without huge plot holes as we delve into the oldest cold case mystery in horse racing history. A mystery in history, huh? Well, we came to Calumet Farm, founded by the Wright family and part of the lush Bluegrass Society of Lexington, Kentucky. Run by Calumet President J.T. Lundy, ex-husband of the Wright family's granddaughter, Cindy, their prize champion thoroughbred, is delightful Aladar, a magnificent athlete, felled before his time with a broken leg in November 1990. The theory that on a peaceful night, Aladar kicked his stall door or somehow entangled his leg in between the stall door and wall, snapping his cannon bone, the strongest bone in a thoroughbred. The question is, accident or murder? Well, let's find out. Before Aladar's death, our author, Fred Cray, explains that Lundy was the, quote, captain of the Titanic, end quote, knowing too well the iceberg of debt that were Calumet's finances. Captain Lundy knew Calumet was floundering, desperate to recover and continue his luxurious lifestyle. Evidence shows he'd written a resignation letter on March 15, 1991, but never submitted it. Calumet's board meeting was scheduled for April 1991. Self-servingly prepared, Lundy took out a loan with the Calumet horses, their breeding rights, and some real estate as collateral, acquiring a $700,000 lifeboat. Bertha Wright, her children, their spouses, her attorney, J.T. Lundy, Lyle Roby, the financial business and legal advisor to the family, Gary Matthews, Calumet's CFO, plus various bank presidents and trustees who were involved with the Warren Wright Jr. Trust, assembled. Again, Lundy was supposed to present a coherent plan for Calumet to pay off its debts, which he did not have. Instead, he asked for more time, again. The bankers demanded a schedule of payments. Agitated, belligerent when challenged, Lundy threatened them. Lundy threw down, quote, you step outside and we'll talk about it. The bank doesn't control me, but if the family wants me to leave, what I'm saying is I will, end quote. He slammed the resignation letter on the table, turned and left hopping into his lifeboat, the first to paddle away from the sinking farm. Lyle Roby took over the meeting, but the rights were finally fed up. Quote, the decision to replace Lundy had been made before the meeting. Everyone except Roby 
thought they were prepared for the worst. Roby knew they were not. End quote. Enter John Ward. The bank had picked John Ward, owner trainer of John T. Ward Stables, an experienced horseman and businessman, to sort out the mess that was Calumet. Originally, Ward estimated that Calumet was uh, $60 million in debt and that reorganizing and establishing a payment schedule would solve the farm's problems, returning it to profitability. Then he realized none of the 1991 bills, except water, electricity, and telephone, had been paid. Examining the books in the paper trail, taking shrill phone calls, pressure mounted, as Ward realized the debt was closer to $118 million, which was utterly insurmountable. Calumet Farm declared bankruptcy on July 11, 1991. In less than 10 years, Lundy had utterly destroyed a horse racing dynasty. Bank after bank was owed tens of millions. First City National of Houston, $32.4 million. Mutual Benefit, $21.9 million. Riggs National Bank of Washington, D.C., $9.6 million. And on and on. Speculation mounted that Lundy had looted Calumet for his own personal gain. In the end, Calumet owed $167 million. And Lundy had siphoned funds from the Warren Wright Jr. Trust as well as Wright Enterprises. Shocked, the Wright heirs owed $80 million for loans they'd personally guaranteed. Their assets were subject to creditors now that the loans were in default. The Wright family members claimed that they were manipulated, that they'd been pressured into signing documents, and that bank trustees also failed to stop Lundy. They would sue the banks for failing to protect the trust and their personal fortunes. Quote, the bankruptcy proceedings, lawsuits, and countersuits would take years to resolve. The Lundy era ended with a total and thorough destruction of Calumet and all those who had inherited it. End quote. So lesson learned. Never, ever give check signing power to anyone else. Be aware of what is happening with your own investments, finances, and livelihood. Looking back, Charlie Rose viewed his years with Aladar as the thrill of a lifetime. Famous photos and three of Aladar's horseshoes, one for each of the Triple Crown races, adorned his wall as a tribute to the wonderful horse. Hearing that Aladar died, his trainer, John Veach, said Aladar was the best horse he'd ever trained. Aladar's legacy was assured as his offspring included not only Ali Sheba and criminal type, but easygoer, Turkoman, and strike the gold. Just sick at heart, Veach spoke to Sports Illustrated magazine, quote, they had a great stallion and instead of breeding him to a select group of high quality mares, they were jeopardizing his life by breeding him so much. I guess nobody realized how badly they needed the cash, end quote. March 26th, 1992. Calumet's real estate and personal property went up for auction. Heinrich D. Kwiatowski bought it for $17 million, and the auction raised $19.2 million, with the vast majority going to pay off loans. When Heinrich D. Kwiatkowski died in March 2003, Calumet passed to a Bahamian trust. In 2012, it was sold to the Calumet Investment Group for $36 million. One member, billionaire Brad M. Kelly, has gradually returned Calumet to racing relevancy again. In 2022, Calumet Thoroughbred, Rich Strike won the Kentucky Derby as an 80 to one shot. But still, the farm remains a shadow of its former glory, the golden age of thoroughbred racing ending with the spectacular rivalry of Aladar and Affirmed. Insurance adjuster Tom Dixon told author Fred M. Craig, quote, suspicion started almost from day one that Aladar had been killed for the insurance money, end quote. In September, 1991, 
freelance author Carol Flake began writing a book on Calumet's demise. Her article in Connoisseur magazine called The Killing Fields concluded that Aladar was worth more dead than alive. She painstakingly documents Lundy's insane spending, bank loans, and Aladar's breeding income. Bertha Wright's attorney, Don Sturgill, was quoted saying Lundy had burned through $300 million in his 10-year tenure. Long before Aladar's death, Lundy and Calumet were in fiscal peril. Last-minute loans and deals were keeping things afloat, borrowing from Peter to pay Paul. Flake's convincing timeline marked November 1990 as the perfect time for Aladar to die. A few of the preceding events were October 28, 1990, First City National Bank of Houston reconsolidated their $45 million loan, warning that if Calumet didn't pay the outstanding debt by February 28, 1991, they would foreclose. November 1st, 1990, Golden Eagle Insurance notified Lundy it was canceling their $5 million policy by the end of December. Flake interviewed Tom Dixon, who told her about the sheared off roller bracket and that Lundy had told him the story of Aladar kicking the stall, leaving marks behind. While that's downright false, Lundy had seen no marks, nor do his photos show anything. Of Dr. Larry Brambledge, Blake writes, quote, that it was not just a kick to the stall door that injured the horse. It was the kind of injury that Brambledge would see in horses running and hitting something, catching their legs in a hole or being struck by a car, end quote. She spoke to other veterinarians. All concurred that a simple kicking a door could not have caused Aladar's injury. A torque action was required which seems somewhat far-fetched for an animal who had been quiet and calm all night to suddenly rear up at 10 p.m. Carol Flake also analyzed Aladar's breeding rights debacle. There were at least 19 lifetime breeding rights with the bulk already sold for 1991. She wrote, quote, Aladar was bringing in far less annually than the amount for which he was insured, end quote. At age 15, Aladar's potential breeding ability was ebbing and would cease in the future. Fun fact, thoroughbreds generally live between 25 and 28 years, according to horseracingsense.com. Now, unfortunately, Blake's article didn't have a wide enough readership to create a controversy. But a year later, that controversy arrived. With a circulation of over 3 million, William Knack and Lester Munson's article, Blood Money, appeared in Sports Illustrated magazine. The focus was on Tommy Burns, who conspired with 40 owners, trainers, veterinarians, and riders to collect insurance money after he killed their horses, which is simply horrifying. Knack and Munson had included questions about Aladar in their story. Quote, had Aladar, whose life had been insured for $36.5 million, been the victim of an insurance scam? End quote. Aladar's income for 1991 would have been approximately $7 million, minus $2 million in insurance premium payments, and the pharma's behind insurance payments for $2.6 million, with Golden Eagle's cancellation looming just two weeks away when Aladar died. With the threat of foreclosure by First City Bank, the fastest route to income to make the payment was insurance money. Knack and Munson also conferred with veterinarians, who also said that breaking a cannon bone would require a serious blow, equivalent to being hit by a car. Lloyd's investigation by Tom Dixon was also called into question. His accident ruling, supported by the emotional decision to go with the Hail Mary surgery and the, quote, concern people at Calumet displayed towards Aladar, end quote. Stung by this, Dixon defended his work, asking why they would go to all this trouble, with the authors replying, quote, 
36.5 million reasons, end quote. Dr. Bramblidge had been interviewed by Steve Haskin, a seasoned horse journalist for the Daily Racing Forum. Clarifying, Bramblidge said it wasn't a simple kick to the door. Quote, from a medical aspect, the initial fracture was very compatible with a low energy bending fracture. If you saw the inside of the stall door where the door supports had actually been broken off, it was readily apparent he had kicked his foot out between the stall door and wall. And in trying to get it back in, he probably slipped and bent it sideways. It was a spiraling fracture. It was nothing like someone hitting the leg with a crowbar, which would give you a more transverse and highly pulverized fracture at the site where it occurred." End quote. Bramlage went on to describe Aladar's second fall, which he had not witnessed, only repeating what he had been told. Aladar, quote, was a curious horse, and when he heard something outside, he went to the door, forgetting his leg was immobilized, slipped, and fell, fracturing the femur bone above the cast." End quote. But wait, Bramblidge originally told Lloyds that the second fall stemmed from Aladar's temperament, obstinate, spoiled, nervous. So which is it? After the Knack and Munson article, the Los Angeles Times interviewed Dr. Bramblidge and Baker, who said this was just ridiculous. Aladar was worth more alive than dead, and they'd resorted to Herculean efforts to save him. Yes, yes, they had, but those Herculean efforts stemmed from the insurance companies, not J.T. Lundy's concern for his beloved horse. The insurance companies insisted they try. After two more articles appeared questioning the cause of Aladar's injury, the matter quieted until the publication of Anne Hagdorn Auerbach's book, Wild Ride, ignited the suspicions once more. An accomplished author and a white-collar crime reporter for the Wall Street Journal, Auerbach had access to Calumet documents via John Ward. In her book, Bramblidge again states that the fracture stemmed from the leg getting caught and bending, the entanglement theory. But in just paragraphs earlier, Tom Dixon contradicts Bramblidge, saying, quote, there wasn't room in there for the leg to get in there, and there would have been a whole lot more tearing of tissue. There would have been a whole lot more blood. He just happened to have kicked the door too hard in the wrong way, end quote. Well, that's certainly a disconnect. Was it the entanglement theory or a kick to the door? Was there even space for a kick of that strength to happen in the stable? Anne Haggardorn Arbach also revealed that First City National Bank of Houston employee, Frank Seahag, had smoothed over Calumet's loan difficulties, making sure they were not vetted, exposing many of the irregularities occurring on the periphery of Aladar's life. Summarizing, Arbach wrote, quote, that horse basically was a maxed out credit card by the time he died. You don't kill the goose that laid the golden egg. But that horse was no longer the golden goose." End quote. Oof. By 1996, Assistant U.S. Attorney Julia Tamala was investigating Frank Sehack, Vice Chair of the Board and Senior Credit Officer of First City National Bank of Houston. Sehack was neck deep in a variety of fraud cases, receiving kickbacks from a number of clients and insiders. As Tamala investigated, the name Aladar kept coming up as collateral for this loan and that loan. She wondered, quote, why a Houston bank with no experience with racehorse lending loaned $50 million to Calumet located in Lexington, Kentucky? And why had so many first city loans gone bad? End quote. And just like that, FBI, FDIC, Office of Inspector General, and the IRS were investigating Calumet, an acronym nightmare. Julia Tamala and FBI agent Robert Foster flew to Calumet, interviewing watchman cowboy Kip, the regular guy who worked the night shift, 
and had been asked to take off and rest up the night of November 13, 1990, by a mysterious man in J.T. Lundy's Crown Victoria. And the day watchman, Alton Stone, who took Cowboy Kip's place that night. Private security guard, Aaron Keed Hiley, was also questioned. These witnesses would testify before a grand jury in Houston, where Alton Stone contradicted himself repeatedly on the stand. As a result, Alton Stone was arrested on January 14, 1998, on two charges of perjury before the grand jury. The prosecution was convinced that Alton was present when Aladar was injured or he knew who was. Why else lie? Which is a good question. Pressuring Alton Stone, the feds hoped they'd get to the guy who they believed had done serious wrong, J.T. Lundy. Christopher Goldsmith was appointed Alton Stone's defense attorney, a veteran legal practitioner with 16 years experience. It was Goldsmith's contention that the federal prosecution's position was cooperate or be prosecuted. Problem was, Goldsmith's client knew nothing. The Alton Smith perjury trial began on January 23, 1998. In her opening statement, Tamala admitted that the grand jury was still investigating whether Calumet was involved in killing Aladar for the insurance money. This trial was about Alton Stone's testimony before that grand jury. Why had day watchman Stone worked the night shift November 13, 1990? And where was he when the horse was injured? The prosecution would, quote, prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Alton Stone was present when the horse was injured, and thus Alton Stone lied to the grand jury to cover it up, end quote. Goldsmith, in his smooth Southern drawl, presented the defense position that this was all about Alador's heartbreakingly sad, unintentional injury. Alton Stone had no intention to lie. It was seven and a half years later, and memory can become inconsistent. Alador deserved to rest in peace. The prosecution called the grand jury foreman, Ed Sanford, to the stand who confirmed that they were exploring whether Aladar's injury was a criminal scheme. Sanford stated that, quote, it was suspicious that a couple of nights before the insurance was due that somebody switched, end quote, meaning Alton working for Cowboy Kip. Tamala asked, did Alton Stone's inconsistent testimony recited under oath likely influence the outcome of the grand jury? Well, Sanford agreed it could, and this is very damaging to Stone's case. Lying that influences the grand jury's verdict is serious. But, but, but. All right, so before we delve further into the perjury trial, the financial shenanigans are highly relevant and have to be understood, so you have to bear with me here. I am streamlining greatly. So five months before Aladar's death in the summer of 1990, First City National Bank loan officer, Terry D'Souza, reviewed Calumet's loan portfolio, about $40 million. At the same time, Calumet requested another loan of $15 million to cover pending expenses and delinquent insurance premiums. At least $2.5 million was due on Alador, who was collateral for the First City loans, plus other Calumet horses. But Calumet had no cash flow. Thus, on October 10, 1990, at Frank Seahack's insistence, First City restructured Calumet's loan, wrapping much of the debt into a giganto loan for $42,250,000 due on February 28, 1991, the entire shebang. On the same day, another loan for $2.5 million was made to cover the insurance premiums, also due on February 28, 1991. If Calumet failed to pay, the farm would go into foreclosure, Calumet losing all of their collateral, Alador as well. I would be having some sleepless nights for sure with all this hanging over my head. November 8, 1990, Calumet applied for another loan of 2,600,000 to pay the interest previously due on other outstanding loans. 
With no vetting, this was approved and the paperwork was signed November 19th, 1991. And guess what? This third loan is also due February 28th, 1991. The total debt to First City was now well over $47 million. And that's just one bank. There were other loans to other banking entities as well. So Calumet is teetering on the brink of bankruptcy just eight years after J.T. Lundy took over the debt-free Calumet farm. Few knew these dire circumstances, and J.T. Lundy certainly did. All of this came out during Stone's perjury trial. Loan officer D'Souza confirmed that First City received a payment of $20 million drawn from the insurance payout on Aladar's death. How fortunate Aladar had died so they could collect and pay almost half of the Giganto loan, right? Well, I believe that's called motive. Goldsmith tried to show alternative sourcing for payments, but D'Souza insisted that future loans were not available to Calumet. The insurance money breakdown went as follows. Lloyds of London paid out 36.5 million. 20.5 million went to First City, 1 million to Calumet, and 15 million to those who had insured the breeding rights on Aladar. Golden Eagle Insurance Company followed with a $5 million payment, which also went to First City. A financial meltdown was averted, at least temporarily. April 1st, 1991. With Lundy ousted, John Ward takes over as president of Calumet. And three months into running Calumet, Ward realizes that they were $120 million in debt and declared bankruptcy. February 1991, Ward testified that Calumet could barely make the $20,000 payroll, let alone any ginormous loan payoffs. On cross-examination, Goldsmith got into Alidar's injury and got Ward to admit that if the roller bracket was broken, the edge of the door would be free to move outward. So a horse could get his leg caught between the door and the stall, causing it to panic. The next witness was J.T. Lundy's sister, Kathy Lundy Jones, who had handled Calumet's insurance since 1987. She was given immunity, which hinged on her not straying from her previous statements to the feds. Well, that's interesting. Jones explained the various insurance policies on Calumet horses and Aladar specifically. Policies ran 12 months. The $5 million Golden Eagle policy would have expired by the end of December 1990. Lloyd's policy and another $3 million policy were set to expire at the end of February 1991. Since 1986, Calumet had barely made insurance payments, relying on renegotiation. Jones told the court, quote, the premiums on all the policy were millions of dollars a year. The only money that was paid was $30,000 to Golden Eagle in the fall of 1990, and the money to make the payments came from First City, end quote. Kathy resorted to paying some premiums herself, thinking her brother would pay her back. Well, he did not, and she was out millions of dollars. In September 1990, Learning that the Golden Eagle policy on Aladar was not being renewed, Kathy told J.T. Lundy and CFO Gary Matthews. Now this was critical to the prosecution's case. J.T. Lundy knew exactly when Aladar would lose millions of his insurance coverage. During Goldsmith's cross, Kathy recalled J.T. calling her, saying that Aladar was injured. Arriving at the Stallion Barn 10 minutes later, she saw JT, Tom Dixon, whom she had called earlier, and Alton Stone. Everyone was fraught and teary. During surgery the next day, JT was anxious, and afterward, everyone seemed hopeful. The next day, after Aladar's second break, Dixon, Dr. Rhodes, Dr. Baker, and Susan McGee were all crying. Yet questions arose from her testimony. Lundy lived out on his midway farm approximately 20 minutes from Calumet. So how had Lundy gotten to Aladar's stall so quickly? Had he already been at Calumet? And if so, 
What was he doing? Golden Eagle insurance adjuster, Brian Chambers testified next. Rather than paying the premiums in a lump sum, as was the norm, Calumet had gotten an accommodation to pay premiums in installments, which resulted in Golden Eagle not renewing Aladar's policy. Three to four weeks later, the horse was dead. How had Chambers learned of Aladar's injury? November 14, 1990, his boss, John Maybe, called Chambers around 5.45 a.m. with the news. Chambers contacted Terry McVeigh, telling him to go and get the details directly. McVeigh called back, telling an astonished Chambers that he'd been refused entry at Calumet. Never, ever had Chambers had an investigator refused entry before. McVeigh was told, go back, threaten them that Golden Eagle would refuse to pay the claim. But what was not asked during this trial, why had McVeigh been denied entry in the first place? And why was the stall repaired prior to the insurance adjuster McVeigh's arrival to investigate the claim? I mean, who does that? You have a flood in your basement and you fix it before the insurance adjuster sees what the damage was? No, of course not. No one does that. While allowed finally into Calumet and taking photographs, McVeigh learned that there had been a broken roller bracket. Chambers testified that, quote, one of the pictures was of the stall door and the pin was straight and the concrete wasn't broken. The door was nicely varnished, end quote. All of this was suspicious as hell to Chambers. Quote, I have adjusted claims for years and I did not like the conflicting stories refusal to permit access, the business about the stall door being broken, Chambers thought the claim was manufactured, end quote. But based on the actual information that they had, there was just not enough to deny the claim, and the loss payee was First City Bank. When Goldsmith questioned Chambers about Aladar kicking the wall, Chambers said, quote, it is a stretch of the imagination to think of a horse strong as they are, that is powerful enough to break a cinder block wall. No horse has kicked a block wall that hard." End quote. Next up was Harold Eugene Kipp Jr., a.k.a. Cowboy Kipp. Cowboy had joined Calumet in 1985, guarding the stallion barn. Eventually, he became responsible for the whole farm with three assistants. But half a year before Aladar's death, the three were laid off, with Kip responsible for the whole farm. This meant he'd have to leave the stallion barn unattended while doing the rest of his four nightly rounds. Now, this is a man who's a workhorse himself. In October 1990, Kip had gone on a rare vacation to Las Vegas with his girlfriend, spending five or six days there. On the stand, Kip revealed that a week before Aladar died, he was flagged down by someone in Lundy's Blue Crown Victoria around 6.15 p.m. He had seen the guy wearing sports jackets in Lundy's office a couple of times before. Concerned that Kip was getting burned out, the man asked Cowboy if he wanted to take a night off. Well, bizarre, Kip thought, but sure, why not? Having no preference as to when, the man suggested the following Tuesday, with Kip agreeing. Cray writes, quote, And just like that, the management was involved in getting Kip to take the night off the night Aladar was injured. It was a shocking revelation and a devastating critique of the insurance investigation, end quote. Who was the guy in the sports jacket? Well, under oath, Kip also denied asking Alton Stone to substitute for him that night, directly contradicting Stone's grand jury testimony. Stone had also testified that employee Bruce Waldridge overheard Kip asking Stone to sub for him. Well, there's a problem though. Bruce Waldridge's personnel records showed the man wasn't working at Calumet in November, 1990. He had left a year earlier, and Alton Stone's alibi witness vanished into the ether. Why is this guy lying? There has to be a reason, and it certainly seems nefarious. The night of Alador's injury, Kip was out on a date. 
Later, around 1.15 a.m., he and his girlfriend had gone by Calumet and saw media at the front gate. Immediately, Kip was worried about Alidor and learned about his broken leg. With his girlfriend leaving, Kip stayed the night, only leaving when Alidor was taken to the clinic. Of Alidor, Kip had only high praise. He would tell Fred Cray, quote, He was smarter than most horses and unusually quiet. Sometimes he would try to get Kip's attention by walking around the stalls in circles. And then if you didn't catch him right away, he'd go up and hit the stall door with his front legs, end quote. These older, downwardly curved hoof prints in the evidence photo were left by Alidor's front hooves, not rear hooves, which would curve upward. And all of this contradicted Tom Dixon and Drs. Baker and Bramblidge. Kip explained that a carrot would soothe Alidor. But once, like during 1989-1990, Alidor did get leathered up, frantic in the stall, and Kip got the vet to give him a tranquilizer. But even this one time, he never violently kicked with his rear legs. Mostly, Alidor was quiet at night. And definitively, Kip said he could hear Alidor from the breezeway, from the breeding shed, and the other barn. Alidar was not a kicker. And then based on this testimony, it's clear that Stone could have heard Alidor if he had been violently kicking. Goldsmith now suggested that Stone had confused Cowboy's Vegas vacation with taking this night off. Kip rejected that, no way. Then Smith tried to rattle Kip on the mysterious man in the Crown Victoria, with Kip even giving a more detailed description evidence of his excellent memory. And Kip did tell Goldsmith that Alidor was a spoiled brat. Now, Alidor's temperament became a bone of contention. Spoiled, demanding attention, the defense said that Alidor was, quote, overindulged without an accomplishment, end quote. That bugs me. Alidor was not without accomplishment. But the prosecution was seeking to prove perjury, not to defend Alidar's personality. However, Cray does, and I agree, quote, Alidar was a superstar. Nobody calls out Michael Jordan, Tom Brady, Serena Williams for being spoiled brats. They earned and deserved their lavish lifestyles. And so did Alidar. In the range of stallion behavior, Alidar was mild manner, not a man killer like Capote, end quote who was another of Calumet's breeding stallions, far more violent, kicky, and bitey. Capote chased grooms out of the stall, fearing for their lives. And another horse, Tim Tan Alley, he had actually bitten Alton Stone's finger off. All right, compared to them, Alidor is mild. And on redirect, Tamala asked Kip if he believed the story of how Alidor came to be injured. No, he did not buy the entanglement theory or the kicking theory. Aaron Keed Hiley was sworn in. In his grand jury testimony, Stone testified that he and Keed Hiley were talking between 8.30 and 9.30 p.m. and then went to the canteen. There, about 15 minutes, they headed back to the stallion barn with Hiley going off to do his rounds. Stone heard some nickering, ran, and found Alidar writhing with sweat. Now, this diverges from the story Stone told Dixon diverges from what he told Carol Flake for her article and what he told author Ann Auerbach. All of these versions are different from his grand jury testimony, too. Goldsmith was really left with one chance for acquittal, to prove that Alidar's injury was an accident, making Stone's grand jury testimony irrelevant, which is pretty much blown to shreds, in my opinion. And all of the Stone versions of that night fueled the prosecution's suspicions. Why was he lying? Was he covering up something? Now, I also found it weird that Hiley, whose job was to keep patrol around Calumet's perimeter, preventing trespassing, was never interviewed before the FBI's investigation. Seems to me it's logical to interview everyone on the scene that night, especially if they're involved in security. So Hiley worked the 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. shift, Monday through Friday, driving the grounds in a gold shield security vehicle, each round taking 45 minutes. 
the security office was in the broodmare barn where communication chargers were kept. With a radio mounted in his vehicle and a calumet walkie-talkie, Hiley had the means to contact anyone he might need. That night at 10 p.m., he headed out to the broodmare barn to swap out batteries for the walkie-talkies. He glanced over at the stallion barn, seeing Stone's pickup truck with the parking lights on. He headed over to shoot the shit, and he'd use the phone there to give his wife a call as he did it every night at 10 p.m. As he pulled in, Stone was already backing out with Stone waving, see you. Hiley also noticed lights on in the Calumet office. Inside, the stallion barn was dark. And while talking to wife Dana, Hiley, quote, heard a nickering noise, a groaning sound, end quote. He hung up and went to check the horse stalls. Tamala asked, quote, and when you looked into Aladar's stall, what did you see? He had a leg broke. Hiley then radioed Stone for help, end quote. Stone arrived a minute later. Hiley's recollection of what transpired next were hazy, tainted by emotion and shock. Stone called farm manager Sandy Hatfield, with Hiley deciding to get out before his truck was blocked in. On his gold shield radio, his boss sent him to the front gate to keep an eye on the media. Tamala now asked, had Hiley hung out with Alton Stone at the canteen? No, that was too far away. He needed to hear the Gold Shield radio, so he had stuck close to the Broodmere bar. Okay, key takeaways. His witnessing the lights being on at the office possibly implies that Calumet's management was present that night. Stone was seen leaving the scene, suggesting that he had hurt Aladar, with Hiley discovering the horse injured not 10 minutes later. On cross, Hiley admitted that his 10 p.m. time frame could be more fluid from 9.45 to 10.15 p.m. In his previous grand jury testimony, Hiley had hedged, uncertain if he or Stone had found Aladar. Now he said, quote, when you sit and you think about something that long ago, it starts to come back to you. Of course, you're not going to remember everything, end quote. Um, if I found a $40 million stud thoroughbred, the golden goose with a broken leg, it would be seared into my memory. Significantly emotionally laden memory is called flashbulb memory. You remember every detail. About Aladar, Hiley said that if Aladar didn't get his carrot around 10 p.m., he'd have a fit and kick, although he had never witnessed this himself. But he heard a noise, quote, like a horse kicking a big piece of wood, kicking a concrete block, end quote. Huh, was that the noise Lundy had referred to in his first abandoned version of events? And was that noise a horse kicking or some other blunt force? I don't know. On this important redirect, Tamala let Hiley explain that during the grand jury, he thought the IRS was after him and only later realized it was about Aladar's death. Ultimately, though, in this grand jury testimony, Hiley had testified that he specifically was the one who found Aladar. Only this was in his latter testimony, which Goldsmith had conveniently ignored. The prosecution now called Hiley's ex-wife, Dana, who was the Gold Shield Security Dispatch Operator, working the same shift as her then-husband. She confirmed that Keed usually called her around 10 p.m. That night, they'd had normal conversation, and then he said he had to go. Five or maybe 10 minutes later, he called her back saying Aladar had broken his leg. Again, Goldsmith had Dana admit that the call could have occurred between 9.45 and 10.15 p.m., but Dana insisted that she found out about Aladar at 10.15 to 10.20 p.m. Had Hiley told Dana he saw the lights on in the office, or he'd seen Stone casually walking away from the barn? No, no, he hadn't. Question is, did Keed Hiley have a reason to lie? And I hate to leave you hanging mid-trial like this, but I am. This completes episode 93, Entanglements. 
the perfect name, right? But the good news is I will be dropping my next episode, 94, Jurisprudence, next week. At trial, under oath, the testimony in Alton Stone's trial continues to shed great light on what happened to Alidor, and we will see what Alton Stone's fate will be. And our next book, read with me or let me tell you the story. At CrimeCon 2024 in Nashville, I met Lindsay Wade and my admiration for her knows no bounds. Published in 2022, In My DNA is the story of Lindsay's 21-year law enforcement career, investigating horrifying crimes against young women and girls, igniting her relentless pursuit of justice for victims in the Tacoma region of Washington State. And we gain her unique perspective as a biracial female detective in this male-dominated profession. And I found this aspect to her story compelling. Thank you for listening, Murder Bookies. I see you as you hear me. You've probably noticed I'm making some changes to the podcast. So let me know if you've noticed and approve. And please take a few minutes to leave an awesome five-star review that helps me make new Murder Bookies. Share this podcast with a friend. I can always be reached at jill at murdershelfbookclub.com or on X, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Or join Patreon for $4 a month. It's hot out, wear sunscreen, find your joy, and I'll see you next week. Written and produced by Jill, all rights reserved. Music, The Pewter Elephant by Blue Dot Sessions.